And that, that was pretty awesome, I thought. And uh, he said, you know, if I go in the hardware store to pick a saw, I bring a bow with me. <laughs> and he asks to try out the different saws until he gets one that sounds right. They might think he's a little weird, but I have a saw that I put a handle on like that, and I ground the teeth off of it, and I can make it sing like that, but I can't play a song with it. But if I practiced a little more, maybe I could. I don't know. It's my goal anyway. Matter of fact, I have two or three of them. You can find some saws in a junk shop or antique store for three bucks that might sing a song. But anyway, um, it's not like if you just wish that you could do that, then you can do it. <laughs> you have to put a little bit of effort into it, like a lot of things, right? <laughs> Play that spoon every day, don't you? <laughs> In the time of the Holy Roman Empire, there was a chronic shortage of hay, which uh, to which uh, with which to feed the army's horses. So, so much so that the emperor issued a mandate that restricted its use even going as far as cutting in half the width of all brooms. They figured they were saving some hay, but brooms made out of straw. So anyway, this became standard use, and over time, no one questioned it why there were half brooms. With the exception of lowly servants who were asked, tasked with the cleaning of castles and other government buildings, so you fast forward to the end of World War I and uh, the decline in the use of cavalry, cleaning crews saw this as a perfect opportunity to improve this one area of their work. So they organized and they presented a petition before the League of Nations and finally were able to get governments to allow brooms to be made the width that we know today. And there was much joy at their broad sweeping reform. That was a joke. <laughs> brooms were always broad, I guess. Now there's some colonial brooms that were round. We have one. We have one. So we as believers, you know, we talk about faith a lot. And Hebrews 1, Hebrews 11, the first two verses is, in the King James, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Everybody learns that when they were, when they were kids growing up. And that's the definition of faith in Scripture. So you talk about things not seen. How about Noah? God said, build an ark. Can you imagine what Noah must have thought at first? He said, okay, Lord, I'll get started on it right away. Oh, and by the way, Lord, what's an ark? <laughs> but God gave him very detailed instructions. Exactly how tall it was to be and how wide it was to be and put rooms in it, coated inside and outside with pitch. Can you imagine how much pitch that was? They must collect pitch from pine trees. And, uh, but of course there were years and years to do this. So nothing like this had ever been built before. Animals, Lord, I mean, do you mean like lions, Lord? Do you mean lions and bears and snakes? What about snakes, Lord? So he had his instructions. How long did it take Noah to build the ark? Well, some people say a hundred years. I read a scholar's study, and he estimated that it probably took 50 to 75 years, but he said, we don't really know. He was going uh, on the ages of Noah's sons to compute this 50 to 75 years. You know, in the medieval times, uh, they, they built a cathedral somewhere that took a hundred years to build a cathedral. But anyway, an ark is not a boat. By translation from Latin, it's a box. 
and it's a box that will contain something special or something precious you know it would in the colonial times they had what they call salt boxes in the homes and they had locks on them because salt was a precious thing you, they didn't have refrigerators and so they preserved their meat by salting it and fish and they had these boxes and some of them were very ornate they were made out of walnut and different kinds of wood but I've seen some pictures of these old uh, salt boxes and they had a lock so nobody could steal your salt so this was a, a special box the ark uh, you know like the Ark of the Covenant was too it contained something special but it would seem ridiculous to us that Noah would just comply and start building it seems a little strange this guy just said okay and starts building this Ark he was a preacher he was a real preacher he didn't stay in the Holiday Inn Express that night he was a real preacher he probably had some agricultural experience because everybody did. There, people all grew their own food. This was a long time ago. But he may have been a, a carpenter or some kind of a builder. But on that scale, no one had ever built anything that big. So the effort and God's, the effort it would take to do this and God's instructions, well, it seems ridiculous when you think about it, and it may have seemed that way to him, but he just started in doing it. But it only seems ridiculous to our standards. Acting on something that seems ridiculous, but God calls you to do, is faith. So what was it about Noah that he simply believed and acted? It says in the Bible that he was a preacher of righteousness. It doesn't say that in Genesis. It says that in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5. If he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on its ungodly people, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others. The whole world was evil at that time. The world was filled with violence. Everybody except Noah and his family, seven others, were the only people that God chose to spare. Can you imagine a whole culture of people that are all evil? all violent all of them and Noah was a preacher so that means he was trying to convince those people to mend their evil ways and stop doing that and start living in a way that would please God the Lord saw in verse 5 how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. Even their thoughts were evil. God saw, it says. God always sees. He not only saw everything that they were doing, He not only saw the violence, the idolatry, and the evil, but He also saw what was in their hearts. Only evil all the time. Total depravity. That's what was on the earth at that time, except for Noah and seven others. Everything that they did, everything that they wanted to do was completely evil. They were faithless. They had no concern for what pleases God. Everything they were doing was in opposition to the will of God. Not only ignoring His will, but they were opposed to His will. You know, it seems that they were out just only to please themselves. Satan and his agents were working overtime. They had fertile ground for their evil. A self-pleasing culture just like Sodom and increasingly just like most of the world today is drifting in that direction 
Verse number six, the Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth and his heart was deeply troubled. Can you imagine that? God's heart was troubled and he regretted that he had made mankind. He had put human beings on earth to worship and glorify him. The human race had gone against him. And in their rebellion, they nullified God's design for them. He was through with them permanently. When people ignore the will of God, when they start operating in their own will, and ignoring God's will, they become available for Satan to work his evil in their hearts. Evil had become universal. We're seeing the rise of godless evil in the world today. Judgment is coming. It's coming. Verse number seven. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created. And with them, the animals, the birds and the creatures that move along the ground. For I regret that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of God. Verse number eight. That preacher of righteousness found favor. He had to persevere through all of the negativity that was around him all the time. What was so different about Noah? He had a heart after God. He had a heart after God. He walked with God in righteousness. He loved and respected God. Noah was keenly aware of what pleases God and what did not please God. Noah preached. He warned the people that they needed to repent of their wicked ways. He was a preacher of righteousness, it says. The evil doers must have jeered at this righteous man, made fun of him. What are you doing? But they opposed him and his message in every possible way before he even started building. What he was, was an affront to their way of thinking and their way of life. A spark, a candle in their darkness. And they would, they would rather snuff it out. Genesis 6.22, Noah did everything just as God commanded him. Besides faith, there's something else going on there. You wouldn't start building something like that if you didn't have faith. You'd say, that's ridiculous, I'm not doing that. If the, if, the, if the founders of this church would have said, that's just a piece of wood, you can't make a church there. They had faith. Yes, they can. Yes, we will have a church here. And they did it. God spoke to them, says, you're going to put a church there. They put a church there. They believed it. Faith. But there's something else going on here besides faith in Noah. Verse 8 and 9 of chapter 6, Genesis. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And verse 9, this is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. He was a righteous man. Is believing his faith something that is practiced only by the righteous. Is practicing faith part of being righteous? Hebrews 11, 6, And without faith it's impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. Without faith, you can't please God. Without holiness, without righteousness, you can't please God. Faith starts with God. Faith in Bugs Bunny won't do you any good. 
Faith in chocolate ice cream won't help me. Faith in humanity won't help you unless you're just looking to feel good. Feel goodism is false faith. Humanity fails. All are sinners. Faith in your own self won't get you anywhere with God. That's self-faith, and it goes together with self-righteousness. And believe me, God is not impressed. Faith in your own self won't get you anywhere with God. God gives us gifts and abilities to be used for His glory. It's all about Him. It's all about God. It's not about us at all. Righteousness and faith go hand in hand. Righteousness and faith. Noah walked with God in righteousness and he believed. And he had faith to build something so far out of his comfort zone, so huge, <laughs> that in the natural, it would not only seem impossible, it would seem absurd, it would seem ridiculous. But he had faith to do that. You can only walk with God in righteousness if you have faith in him. When you come to faith in him, that is the starting point of righteousness. Any righteousness that we think we have before or outside of salvation is self-righteousness. Self-righteousness is worthless to God. It's worthless. Isaiah 64, 6, all of us have become like one who is unclean. And all our righteousness acts are, filth, are like filthy rags. We all shriveled up like a leaf and like the wind. Our sin sweeps us away. The only righteousness that counts with God is the imputed righteousness of Christ. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways submit to Him and He will make your paths straight. Submitting to God in faith and in righteousness. That's exactly what Noah did. He was already a righteous preacher. He preached righteousness. And now... This big task would require faith, and he had the faith to do it. He just started doing it. I'm sure God helped him with it. You know, his own understanding, he probably would have thought the task was too hard, too big, too ridiculous. In his own understanding, lean not unto your own understanding. Noah's path was made straight. He had a path of walking with God. Walking with God can only be done in faith and in righteousness. Noah was able to accomplish what God called him to do. He was able to, it took a long time, but he got the job done. He believed and did not doubt. And he lived in holiness. Faith and righteousness move together. Consider Abraham. God called him to go into a land that he didn't know. A culture he didn't know. People he didn't know. Goodbye comfort zone. But he did it. He did it. Then he believed the promise of God that he would be a great nation. He believed it. Even though he and Sarah were old and past the age of childbearing, Abraham was then called to sacrifice his son Isaac, through which this promise of God that you'd be a great nation would be accomplished. And here's the evidence in Scripture of his faith. Genesis 22.5. See, Noah took off on this voyage to go to a mountain and to sacrifice his son Isaac. God called him to do that, and he started out. He didn't tell anybody else about it. And he carried the fire and the knife. Isaac carried the wood for the sacrifice. He had some servants along with him. And in verse 5, he said to the servants, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. That is a statement of faith. 
we will come back to you. God called him to sacrifice his son. But he believed so much. He said, we will come back to you. And as you know, God stayed his hand and stopped him. We will come back to you. He believed God. And the Bible says it was credited to him as righteousness. Faith and righteousness move together always. Consider Moses. God chose a murderer. He was a wanted man. He was a fugitive to go to Pharaoh and demand that he leaves, he, that he lets two to three million Hebrew slaves, a big workforce, demand that they be set free. After arguing with God, Moses obeyed. He went in faith. Moses walked with God. He knew God. He talked with God face to face. He walked in obedience in righteousness Moses believed and he walked in faith faith and righteousness always move together we need to examine our own selves am I moving in righteousness and faith do I have trouble believing what I am praying maybe I'm in need of a righteousness review <laughs> Maybe I need a righteousness adjustment. In my own life, sometimes I have to go back to the cross. Revisit my original salvation. Revisit how I was convicted. Revisit that. Sometimes I have to repent about something. We're all sinners. Repentance is something that should be close to us. So think about your own life. Are you operating in faith and righteousness? Are you holy? The process of sanctification is a continuing process where would we move away from our attachment to the world and move toward God. Our new life is like a new car. You go to the dealership and you buy a new car. They detail it, polish it all up. It's perfect when you drive away. But as soon as you go around a block or drive it home, it's not new anymore. It has road dust on it. Maybe you go through a mud puddle and it has some mud on it. But the car is besmirched. It doesn't take long after you get a new car for it to show wear so what it needs cleaned up it needs cleaned up it needs shined up it needs detailed it's like new again and mine is in desperate need of such a cleanup right now <laughs> you need to change the oil put some gas in our walk is like that we need cleaned up sometimes we need we need made new again the Holy Spirit helps with that we need to invite the scrutiny of the Holy Spirit. Invite Him to shine a light of the truth of the gospel into the inner recesses of our thinking and our, our, our hopes and desires and see if, we're, if there's anything in there that isn't in God's will, that isn't righteous. We need to be open before God. Seek his will. Seek holiness. Believe what he's impressing on you and act on it. Believe and do. Faith results in action. We get impressions from God, from the Holy Spirit. We get impressions that may not be from God. We need to check these impressions out in the Word. The Spirit always goes the way of the Word. If it's, if it's not Word proven, then it's not from God. The devil never stops trying. He's a counterfeiter. So you need to invite that scrutiny, be open to him, seek his will, seek holiness, believe what he's impressing on you, but make sure it's him. Check it out in a word. It's not that hard to do. And act on it. We 
many believers have a lot of trials. Life is hard, but God is good. We have assurances in the Bible. We have promises. God hears us. He hears our prayers. God knows. And God answers. Maybe not the way we think he should. Maybe not how we want him to. But we got to have faith. God answers, but he does things in his own way. He knows what's best. Psalm 118, 5 to 7. When hard pressed, I cried to the Lord. He brought me into a spacious place. Hard pressed, spacious place. The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? The Lord is with me. He is my helper. I look in triumph on my enemies. I think of that young man that I saw saying, I'm not leaving. I'm going to stay here and work for God. Think about that. I saw that on, on YouTube this morning. I'm not leaving. He's going to be pressed on every side. What can mortals do to me? The Lord is with me. He's my helper. I look in triumph on my enemies. Have you ever been hard pressed? Yes. <laughs> of course you have. Maybe these youngins never been hard pressed. <laughs> They're too young. But maybe they have been hard pressed. But you guys, the rest of you, have all been hard pressed at some time or other. You might be feeling hard pressed right now. So what do you need to do? You need to move in faith and holiness. Faith and righteousness always move together. Holiness pleases God. You can't please Him without holiness. If we aren't pleasing God, sometimes we might just be pleasing ourselves, but we shouldn't be worshiping ourselves or anybody else but God Himself. Believe that God is with you. Trust that he knows how best to take care of you. Lord, I thought you were going to do it this way. <laughs> I've had those experiences. I was trying, trying to tell God how, how to take care of things in my life. I can't tell him what to do. He's the boss. <laughs> He's A number one. You can't tell him how to do it. Trust that he knows best how to take care of you. My favorite psalm, Psalm 4610, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The stillness, there's faith in that. There's holiness in that. The knowing is faith in him. Holiness and faith move together. Philippians 4, 6-7 Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving present your requests to God. In every situation, in other words, when you're pressed, when things bad are happening to you, you're to present your, your request with thanksgiving. <laughs> That's a hard hurdle to jump over, isn't it? Present your petition with thanksgiving. And verse 7, And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Why do you need a guarded mind? Because you have an enemy. Because the enemy doesn't want you to move in faith and righteousness. That's why you need a guarded. That's why you need guarded. And the peace of God will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So let me ask you today, have you been moving in faith and holiness? Does your holiness need touched up a little bit? Mine needs touched up all the time. 
<laughs> maybe you don't ha have maybe you don't have to do that but I do sometimes our faith needs touched up a little bit but faith and holiness move together together so if your holiness needs touched up probably your faith does too we had a prayer meeting we got together just like we did this morning we each presented things that we in our hearts that is to present them wait for me to pray for them we did like we did this morning and we need to increase our faith and our holiness so these prayer meetings you know I, I was impressed to do that and it's in in conjunction with what this church is going through and if, if we all have increased faith and holiness faith and righteousness when we come together and pray then I think we'll see the powerful results that God wants us to do or wants to do here and wants to do in us we might not see it the way we think he should do it we can't write the prescription <laughs> God is sovereign he's what if he wants us to turn the chairs all around that way what if he wants us to lay down while we're singing what if he wants us to do something that seems outrageous we don't know what, he, what God's gonna do we have our own ideas about what God should do but our ideas don't matter move in righteousness and faith they have to move together would you come and find a place to pray and just ask God this morning just to increase your faith, increase your holiness. Would you do that?